thank you to the organizers of the Room Now conference for inviting me to come and speak with you today about juvenile spinal arthritis. I'm Pam Weiss um, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania. These are my disclosures. So for the next few minutes, we're going to demystify the juvenile SPA and JIA classification, review the epidemiology of juvenile onset disease, and then we'll talk about the unique aspects of juvenile onset disease that need to be considered when imaging of the axial skeleton in maturing adolescents, um, and also management with a focus on how this is a bit different than for adults. So first off, is juvenile onset spa even a problem in youth? The answer is a very renowning yes. So we know that 10 to 20% of adults with ankylosing spondylitis have symptom onset before age 18. We also know that spondylar arthritis accounts for up to 20% of juvenile arthritis. We know that 15 to 20% of children with spondylar arthritis have axial disease, most often sacroiliitis. The treatment of this disease in children is often suboptimal. We know that less than 20% achieve remission within five years. And we have fewer drugs available to treat juvenile onset disease um, than we do with adult onset disease. So the classification of juvenile arthritis is often a headache for adult rheumatologists to understand. So in order to at least be considered for juvenile idiopathic arthritis, disease onset needs to occur before age 16. The manifestations need to have been present for at least six weeks, and the etiology is supposed to be unknown. The current classification criteria used clinically are the ILAR criteria. And under these criteria, there are seven mutually exclusive categories shown here. Some of the categories are easily comparable to adult conditions, like psoriatic arthritis with psoriatic arthritis. Um, others, like oligoarticular juvenile arthritis, don't have a clear adult counterpart. <clears throat> so if we move through this, systemic JIA is most uh, associated with adult onset stills disease. Polyarticular juvenile arthritis is broken into RF positive and RF negative. Oligoarthritis, as I mentioned, probably overlaps with a lot of the adult diseases, but there's no clear counterpart. Persistent oligoarthritis really refers to kids who have less than five joints affected during the entire disease course. Extended oligoarthritis refers to kids with fewer than five joints the first six months of disease, who develop arthritis ultimately in five or more joints after the first six months. Enthesitis-related arthritis, which you will hear a lot about today, uh, corresponds most closely, but not exactly, to non-radiographic spa. Again, psoriatic arthritis in children is similar to adult psoriatic arthritis, although, again, the classification criteria are different. And then undifferentiated arthritis is what I refer to as the garbage can category of JIA. This is where kids are classified if they meet criteria for more than one JIA category. An example of such a child is a boy who meets criteria for enthesitis related arthritis, but has a dad with psoriasis. So as with spinal arthritis in adults, the term spinal arthritis in pediatrics is an umbrella term for several heterogeneous condi conditions. So these are the categories that are most associated with JSPA. Other phenotypes that are not specifically included in the JIA classification by ILAR are those that I'm showing here. Juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, IBD-associated spondylitis, and reactive arthritis. I will refer to juvenile SPA and ERA or enthesitis-related arthritis throughout the lecture interchangeably. Just keep in mind that groups are similar but not exactly the same. So again, I'll focus a bit more on ERA in this talk because this is the category that accounts for the vast majority of cases of what would traditionally be considered spinal arthritis. And I thought it would be worth just going through the specific inclusion and exclusion criteria of this group for you. So to meet criteria for ERA, children have to have arthritis and enthesitis, or they have to have either arthritis or enthesitis with at least two of the following sacroiliac joint tenderness and or inflammatory lumbosacral back pain, HLA-B27 positivity, 
a family history of HLA-D27 associated disease, acute anterior uveitis, where they must be a boy who is older than six. Exclusion criteria, which often cause a lot of problems, um, and again, wind kids up in the undifferentiated GIA category, are psoriasis in the patient or a first degree relative, RF positivity, or coincident systemic GIA. So this is a study that included data on newly diagnosed patients with JSPA from five centers uh, spanning Europe and North America. From this study, we learned that the prevalence of many of the disease characteristics, including back pain, arthritis, HLA-B27 positivity, especially enthesitis, at diagnosis varied considerably across sites. So now I'm going to give you an epidemiology pretest. And here I'm showing the answer. The one statement that was not true is that peripheral arthritis is uncommon in juvenile onset spinal arthritis. And we'll talk about this on the next slide. So let's consider how the phenotype of juvenile onset and adult onset disease are similar and different. Well, they're similar in that they both have the bread and butter phenotype, including enthesitis, sacroiliac and spinal arthritis, bowel inflammation, male predominance, and symptomatic eye disease. They're different in that back pain and stiffness are less common, and you're going to hear about this multiple times in the next couple of minutes. Peripheral enthesitis in children is actually much more common than adults, as is peripheral arthritis. The most common arthritis pattern is asymmetric involvement of the joints of the lower extremity, typically in an oligoarticular pattern, meaning that throughout the course of disease, fewer than five joints are affected. Um, less than one-third of children have polyarticular involvement, ankle involvement, and tarsitis are both tremendously common. Um, also, in comparison to adults, children are less often HLA-B27 positive. Uh, limitation of lumbar motion and reduced chest expansion are typically pretty late findings and are not routinely monitored um, in pediatric clinics. And the monitoring for sequelae and comorbidities in juvenile onset disease is entirely different than in adult onset disease. And I thought I'd spend a couple of slides um, on this in particular. So one of the joints that we pay particular attention to in juvenile onset disease are the TMJ joints. So arthritis in the TMJ in kids carries a risk of growth impairment as the growth plate is right below the joints. Um, and this is something that we have to monitor in all subtypes of JIA, not just juvenile arthritis, but again, incredibly important. So if one TMJ is disproportionately affected, as in this old image that I'm showing here, you here on the left, um, this can affect the jaw growth, um, which will eventually be asymptomatic, as you can see on the um, picture in the middle of the girl with braces. If both TMJs are affected and the growth um, is uh, messed up. The child may end up with micronathia, as in the girl on the lower right of this slide. Um, this is, of course, correctable once the child has finished growing, but really entails OMFS going in and breaking the jaw, um, which is not an insignificant procedure, and we'd obviously like to avoid that um, as much as possible. Leg length discrepancy is also something that we have to evaluate for longitudinally. Your adult patients have already finished growing, but this is a real problem in kids. So when there's prolonged asymmetric involvement of, say, one knee, um, for lack of a better way to explain this, the knee that's involved actually feeds the growth plate on both sides of the knee. And the involved leg with prolonged inflammation actually grows faster and gets longer. And the leg length discrepancy can be pretty significant. So if you look at these two boys, it's pretty obvious that they have prolonged um, asymmetric involvement of the left knee. 
Um, ultimately, the growth plate on the previously affected leg can close earlier and the leg may actually end up shorter. Again, there are surgical ways to correct, correct this um, and for minor asymmetry, shoe lifts can solve the problem. However, um, it's best just to treat early and avoid this complication if at all possible. So eye inflammation is another comorbidity that I think we pay more attention to in pediatrics and adult onset disease. The screening guidelines that are listed at the top right of the slide are from the ACR AF guidelines and are based on JIA category, ANA status, and age of onset of disease, as well as disease duration. The risk for asymptomatic uveitis and psoriatic arthritis is generally considered quite high. In ERA, like adult onset spa, the eye inflammation is typically symptomatic and screening is generally recommended only once a year. So moving on from sequelae to the epidemiology and disease course of JSPA, this is data from a cross-sectional study of 95 subjects, 21 of whom had ERA. The median disease duration of study entry was 3.5 years. Outcomes of interest were function as measured by the track, which is akin to the hack, well-being and pain. On the left are outcomes for the entire JAA cohort and on the right, are just for children with ERA. And what I want you to focus on is that half of the ERA patients had moderate to severe functional impairment, moderate severe impaired well-being, and 43% of the children reported severe pain. So these kids need some help and we're doing kind of a so-so job at the moment. So moving on to sequelae, so moving on to our second focus area of the talk, we have axial disease. A disease manifestation is likely well known to you, but with a pediatric twist. For starters, here's what we know about axial disease in kids. So 10 to 20% of adults with AS have symptom onset during childhood. Inflammatory back pain is less common in children and rarely present at disease onset. Sacroiliitis is common, spondylitis is rare. Sacroiliitis occurs in up to two thirds of children within 10 years of diagnosis. And risk factors that we know of in the juvenile population include hip arthritis, elevated inflammatory markers, as well as HLA-B27. So the next question we usually ask is when do we start to think about axial disease in kids? Before I give you the answer to this, I'm going to do a juvenile onset imaging pretest for you. And these are the answers. So the question again is, when do we start to look for axial disease in children? Should we look for a diagnosis? Turns out we really should. So this is data from a pros pro prospective cross-sectional study of J-SPOT in healthy children 8 to 18 years of age. Cases were 40 children with new newly diagnosed J-SPOT, 36 with ERA and 4 with PSA. Controls were 14 age and sex masked healthy children. And what you can see here is that uh, eight or 20% of the children or cases with newly diagnosed SPA had evidence on imaging of acute sacroiliitis. 50% of it was bilateral. What's a little bit scary is the majority of them also, even though this was new onset disease, already had evidence of damage on MRI. And what was even scarier is that only three of the eight people with imaging um, sacroiliitis complained of back pain by history or physical exam. So while I've told you a couple of times already, back pain um, is less common in children of presentation, it really doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about this disease manifestation of presentation. And doing predictive probability, we found that children who were HLA B27 positive and had elevated inflammatory markers of diagnosis were most at risk of this complication. 
So how do we screen for this in children? So x-rays are the classic go-to, um, but I'm gonna tell you why we don't like pelvic x-rays in kids based on data. So this was a retrospective cross-sectional study of children with suspected or confirmed SPA who underwent pelvic radiograph and MRI within six months of one another with an aim to evaluate the utility of radiograph prior to MRI when evaluating for disease. So images were scored independently by five MSK imaging experts. And across raters, the discordance between x-rays and MRIs ranged from 48 to 66% uh, for positive radiograph negative MRI scans. On the right of this slide are two illustrative cases from the study. A and B are from a 16-year-old boy. In A, the radiograph was rated normal by all five raters. MRI shown in B of the same patient was rated abnormal by all five raters. So bilateral subchondral bone marrow edema was clearly present. Two raters also reported damage, including erosion and sclerosis. This um, first case illustrates x-rays aren't useful to detect early disease, which we knew. Um, in C and D, we see imaging of a 13-year-old girl with low and mid-back pain, who also has morning stiffness, acute uveitis, and multiple tender indices. The x-ray in C was rated abnormal by all five raters, including findings of erosion, joint space narrowing, and sclerosis. D is the corresponding MRI. Uh, which was rated as completely normal by all five raters. So this illustrates that in children in particular, x-rays are often falsely positive. So the results should impact your practice if you see youth. Uh, radiographs really have limited utility in screening for sacroiliitis in kids, result in a significant proportion of false negative and false positive findings, as well as unnecessary anxiety, radiation, exposure, and cost to the family. <clears throat> So MRIs are the cornerstone of evaluation for non-radiographic spot in adults. It will come as no surprise that MRI is also the cornerstone modality for axial disease evaluation in pediatrics. However, once again, there's a twist. In the normal maturing pelvis, we often see bright apophysial cartilage that can be easily mistaken by uh, inexperienced readers for inflammation. Shown here are T1 and STIR pelvic sequences of an 11-year-old pubertal boy. STIR is a fluid sensitive sequence, so the preferred sequence for looking for inflammation. And as you can see here with the help of the arrows on the right, there is a homogeneous and symmetric bright subchondral signal that extends along the sacral apophyses. I like to describe this to my fellows with what looks like tracing along the sacral side of the joint with a Sharpie. This is a very normal finding in the sacroiliac joint and not pathology. So this study, uh, by Chauvin et al. described the normal appearance of the maturing SAJ in healthy children. So using images prospectively collected on 70 healthy kids ages 8 to 18, this team developed an ordinal system that grades the amount of subconscious signal seen in the healthy maturity skeleton, ranging from stage 1 to 4. And the take-home points from this study were children progress from type 1 to 4 as they approach adulthood. The metaphysical equivalent signal in the healthy um, child is homogeneous and symmetric, um, on the top left, we see type 1 change is characterized, again, by homogeneous bright subconscious signal extending along the sacral apophyses. Types 1 and 2 signal were present in most prebirtal children, and as they approach skeletal maturity, type 1 signal disappears, and type 2 signal was uh, detectable in only a minority. Type 4 on the lower right is essentially what you're used to seeing in adults. So again, as rheumatology providers, we should know about these changes in the SIJ and be aware that normal signal can be mistaken for inflammatory change by those not used to viewing pediatric studies. So this is another way to visualize the frequency of these findings. Again, type 1, 2, and 3 are present in the majority of prepubertal children. By the time they start to approach skeletal majority, type 1 signal disappears. Type 2 signal is there in less than 10%. And when we looked at these results stratified by males versus females, females seem to start out with more type 1 signal, but seem to progress the type 4 signal faster. So MRI um, can also be tricky in youth for reasons other than evaluation of active inflammation. So as part of the study of 70 healthy kids, we also evaluated the prevalence of cortical irregularities. And we found that SIJ cortical irregularities are really common. They occur most often along the ileum and are really numerous in the peripubertal group. 
These findings correlate with prior autopsy findings, which reported that the sacral iliac bony surfaces are smooth until puberty, and then often develop bony ridges and grooves, primarily of the ilium. This finding is different from that seen in adults in whom irregularities may uh, infer degenerative change. Again, it's important to recognize these features as they're variations in normal anatomy, and we don't want them mistaken for erosions. I include this next study because it highlights how problematic interpretation of the SIJs in kids can be. In this study, eight hospitals each contributed up to 20 cases of consecutively imaged children and adolescents with JAA and suspected sacroiliitis. All the studies were independently reviewed by three pediatric radiologists, and the test properties of local reports were calculated using central imaging team majority of the, as a reference standard. Now, as you can see on this table, the sensitivity for uh, local reports for detecting active sacroiliitis and MRI was quite high and ranged from 80 to 100 percent across sites, with an overall sensitivity of 93 percent, meaning few cases were missed. However, the positive predictive value of the local reports ranged widely from 12.5 percent to 100 percent, with an overall positive predictive value of only 52 percent, meaning there were a lot of false positives. To highlight the issues shown here um, are two images from this study that were read as positive from the local report and negative by the central imaging team. A is a coronal oblique image showing homogeneous uniform symmetric increased signal in the sacroiliac periphery. The increased signal extends along the entire sacrum and the dashed arrow shows the increased signal also extends within the cartilage of the sacral bodies. B e is an axial T2 fat sat showing hyperintense metaphysial equivalent signal along the SIJ that is similar in intensity to the metaphysial equivalent signal along the iliac crest. Again, both of these images are normal, but were rated as abnormal by the local radiology team. So again, you should care about this study because there is a great need for increased training of radiologists and rheumatologists to become familiar with the normal appearance of the SIJ. So now we'll move on to our last focus of the talk, which is management. So in pediatrics, like adult onset disease, the management is driven by the number of involved joints and the presence or absence of axial disease. For the treatment of oligoarticular disease or less than five joints, we typically perform joint injections. And if repeat injections are needed, we move on to a DMARD, most often methotrexate. So now I want to give you a management pretest. And this is the answer. Secukinumab is actually the only drug listed here that has FDA approval for use in ERA specifically. So these were recommendations developed by the ACRAF for the treatment of children with polyarticular coarse JIA. Again, all types of JIA which affect five or more joints throughout the course of disease. So in addition to the number of joints, disease activity is a driver of recommendations. And in children, this was based on the clinical juvenile arthritis disease activity score which was based on a um, maximum of 10 joints and the JDAS components or the active joint count, parent-patient assessment of well-being, and physician global. So obviously this slide is hard to read. So I'll point you to the PubMed citation and give you the main takeaway points. So for untreated polyarthritis, NSAIDs are appropriate for symptom management, particularly during initiation or escalation of therapy with DMARGE biologics. However, NSAIDs are not considered appropriate as monotherapy for chronic persistent synovitis in kids. For initial therapy, methotrexate is the preferred drug with an adequate trial considered to be three months. However, if no or minimal response is observed after eight, eight weeks or so, it was agreed that changing or adding therapy may be appropriate at that time. So therapy escalation options included joint injections, increasing the DMAR dose, 
We're adding a biologic. No preference was given between TNF inhibitors, abatacept, or tocilizumab. Tofatzitinib was not approved at this time. The guidelines were drafted, so are not reflected in this algorithm. The same guideline document addressed recommendations for the treatment of JIA with sacroiliitis. The major points to highlight from this table are that NSAIDs are helpful, we should use them. If NSAIDs don't work, we should add a TNF inhibitor. Methotrexate monotherapy does not work for axial disease, um, as shown by uh, studies in adults, and is actually recommended against for use in kids. Um, bridging oral glucocorticoids and uh, intraarticular injections were both conditionally recommended, and PT was conditionally recommended. So this slide is important because I think it's really critical to recognize the same assortment of drugs that are available for use in adult onset disease um, are not available for children and adults with SPA. Sorry, for children with SPA. So for ERA, as I mentioned on your pretest, the IL-17A um, inhibitor, secukinumab, was just approved in January 2022 for the specific indication enthesitis-related arthritis. For polyarticular course JIA, there are actually several drugs that are approved. I just want to remind you that fewer than one-third of ERA patients have polyarticular course. So uh, gaining access to these drugs can still be uh, quite challenging and time-consuming for pediatric rheumatologists. So the TNF inhibitors that are approved for polycourse are adalimumab, etanercept, and golimumab. Um, the IL-6 receptor inhibitor, tocilizumab, is approved as well as the T-cell post-stimulatory inhibitor, abatacept. Um, and of the JAK-STAT inhibitors, only tofetzitinib is approved. So in summary, the terminology in juvenile onset and adult onset spa is different. Juvenile spa is similar to adult onset disease with a male predominance, HLA-B27 positivity, enthesitis, bowel inflammation, symptomatic eye disease, and axial disease. It's different to adult disease, mainly that there's more peripheral disease, including enthesitis and arthritis and fewer axial symptoms, but not necessarily less axial disease. Radiographs really aren't useful in screening for sacroiliitis in kids. MRIs are extremely helpful, but need to be read by individuals who are familiar with the appearance of the maturing sacroiliac joint to, to avoid overcalling sacroiliitis. Um, systemic therapy is largely driven by the number of joints in the presence or absence of axial arthritis, and emerging uh, therapies, including inhibitors of IL-17A, 17A A, A through F, and JAK-STAT, show enormous promise in adults with non-radiographic axial spa and are still understudied in children. So with that, I would like to say thank you, and I'd be happy to answer.